gentleman from 33. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To declare Rule 80, um, I have a conflict as this bill is directly intended um, and as a result of my practice, uh, business doing medical debt collections. As an attorney, I will, however, exercise my right, right, right to vote. If it was just affecting me, I would absolutely not vote, but this affects every Idahoan and especially medical providers. So to, to declare Rule 80 and to debate against the bill. Your declaration under Rule 80 will be noted in the journal, and you have the floor to debate the bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Barry Goldwater once said, a government that is big enough to give you all you want is big enough to take it all away. And I never thought in my legislative career I would see that happen in the state of Idaho. We usually do a pretty good job of keeping government limited, not targeting individuals, individual practices. But here we have it. This bill is not the Idaho way. We've talked a lot about the Red Tape Reduction Act and reducing regulations. So here we have a six and a half page set of new regulations. This bill would put us not on par with California, Illinois, or New York as far as regulation on the medical industry. It would put us the first in the nation, the, the least friendly state for healthcare providers to do business in. Um, this bill will do nothing but, we, we all understand the free market, and as we increase regulation and costs, we've seen time and time again, you show me a regulation that has reduced costs or fees. We see time and time again, and that's exactly what's gonna happen with this bill. Medical providers have a property right in their bills, and this bill aims to take that property right away, and, or to at least severely infringe this right. The, uh, fundamental the fundamental protections violated in this bill are numerous. Um, some of us pay attention to Freedom Foundation when we look to constitutional is issues. You'll see they've rated this a number minus nine, which means CPAC, which usually aligns with them, is not gonna be far away. And it's not the score that I care about. Look at the principles that it talks about that it violates, constitutional principles. Now there's a thing in this country <clears throat> called substantive due process. We can't violate that, and there's some exceptions to that. Um, what that typically means is everybody has a right to due process. The state can, and often we do infringe due process rights a little bit, but the state, first of all, has to have a compelling interest. Let's just assume for sake of argument that in this case they have a compelling interest. Is that to protect the less than 1% of people that find themselves in medical legal actions? And I'll get back to the 1% later because a lot of us have been told it's 15%, and I'll tell you why it's 1% and why that's smoke, mirrors, and half-truths that we've been told that it's 14, 15% that this bill would affect. Um, but that subs back to substantive due process. So assume the state has a compelling interest to do anything like this. The next factor the court will look at, is this the least restrictive means of protecting the state's interest? So assuming we have a state interest to protect this 1% of people who refuse to pay their bills to individuals that provided services, people that are trying to, whether through, their own fault or no fault or their own for circumstances, they're not paying something that somebody else provided. So this substantive due process, I think, assuming this is a valid problem, which I'm going to argue here in 15, 20 minutes, that it is not a valid, um, this, this is not the, le most, the least restrictive way, because the, the transparency portion of this in the United States, this has been going around a long time. All of us believe there should be transparency in the healthcare industry. I tend to agree with that. I, I also tend to agree that doctors have taken the, taken the Hippocratic Oath, and they try to do the best job they can to get these bills out to people. Just think, self-interest alone is motivation for a, a medical provider to properly bill. They want to properly bill because they want to get paid. It's a, you have to believe that. What, what's happened in this country with medical billing, the reason it's so difficult, are regulations. We have heaped regulation upon regulation between the insurance industry and the healthcare industry. We've made it so costly that most medical providers don't or they can't even do their own medical billing. They have to hire outside groups to come in and do this, a whole industry to bill which raises the cost already of health care. Usually those contracts are about 7%. Some higher, some a little lower, but on average I believe it's about 7% that health care providers already have to pay medical billing companies to go through code books that are pages and pages. 
So here we add another layer of regulation. What do you think is going to happen? The way the collection industry works right now with medical collections, um, actually I'm going to talk about the 1% first because that, since I brought that up, I think now is a good time to address that. We were told, and there were some nice glossy handouts, that one in seven patients were in medical debt collections, about 15% of the population. That's probably true. The, the data is not exact, but that's probably true. This bill does not affect that. Well, put it this way. This bill aims at reducing fees and costs on people in medical debt collections. Guess what? That 15%, there are two sets of particular laws and multiple others that prevent anybody, medical debt or other, right now everyone's treated the same, whether it's credit card, uh, rent, um, lawn care, we're all treated the same. All professions are treated the same. They can be sent to collections. The, the, Property owners, the service providers can collect those. They have rights to jury trials. They play by the same set of rules everybody else does with court costs. Uh, things. The American rule was brought up. The American rule is what it says is each party's liable for his own attorney's fees, except since the founding of this country and all times, that rule has been modified. So the prevailing party wins if it's not above a certain limit. In the state of Idaho, that's $35,000. So if you had a, a bill out there that was $35,000, right now, yeah, you have to pay your own attorney's fees. And the reasons legislatures around the country, uh, I think every state has modified the rule to a prevailing party for most cases. The reason they've done that, 35,000 is a big suit. If you recover that, you're gonna take a loss because you're gonna have to pay your attorney's fees. Anything below that, if a doctor or a you know, uh, the lawn care provider has a $200 bill. His court costs in the state of Idaho right now are $166 to file the case. Um, the service fees are usually set by the county. Some counties, a uh, high example is Kootenai County. Most of them are about $55 to $75 to serve for the sheriff. Kootenai County right now is $105. So already a doctor would have $270 in costs. This bill seeks to cap the fees at $350 meaning that good luck going to find an attorney that's willing to file a lawsuit and go through the whole procedure of collecting it for $50. So what this bill essentially does is uh, take the right to counsel representation away from anybody in the medical profit, plus uh, jury trials, and I'll get into that. Um, I mentioned this is not the Idaho way. Frankly, I think it's flat out un-American. Um, <clears throat> in the Constitution, Many of, one of the most famous phrases in the Declaration of Independence actually is uh, the pursuit of happiness. Jefferson is credited with um, coining this phrase. Uh, many of you know that before Jefferson, uh, John Locke, one of the writers that the founders of this country relied a lot upon when they were drafting the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, had a, a trinity of things that he wanted to protect. Those were life, liberty, and property. Jefferson, creatively and I, I think amazingly, I love the, the term pursuit of happiness. He changed those and incorporated them, the, them into the Declaration of Independence by saying life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We all know the Declaration of Independence states we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, <clears throat> that they are endowed by the Creator with certain unalienable rights among them. These are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. To secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. This entire country was founded on the belief that we have a, a fundamental, unalienable rights to life, liberty, and property. That's exactly what this law intends to do, is restrict medical professionals' right to property. The 14th Amendment of the United States Constitution talked about equal protection of the laws, and then specifically said that no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges and immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, property without the due process of law, nor deny any person within its jurisdiction equal protection of the laws. We have repeated in the Constitution what we just had in the Declaration of Independence. Life, liberty, and property is specifically called out in the 14th Amendment. Again, the, 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 the basis of this law is, can not, no doubt be to deprive doctors of a property right. They should be entitled equal protection like anybody else. We don't do this for credit cards. We don't do this for landlord bills. We don't do this for landscaping. We don't do this for anything. Apparently, our justification is nobody wants to get a health care bill. I completely agree. 
Let me talk to you about the protections and what it takes to get to the level that this bill is trying to control. The difference in the 14 percent and the 1 percent. What happens in a doctor's office? We've already talked that doctors want to bill. They do not want to send anything to collections. In, in committee hearing, they heard from many doctors that said the same thing. It makes sense based on self-interest, free market, and capitalism. They want to get paid. They do their very best to bill people and bill as quickly as they can. They don't want to send it to collections because you know how collection agencies, for the most part, get paid? They tell the doctor, assign these accounts to us. We'll give you back. For a fee, we're going to take one-third is a typical amount for our profit. So a doctor already loses 33 percent of their property by having to hire a collection agency to do it. So they don't want to. So that filters out. By the time it gets, well, 86 percent of the people or 85 percent of the people this obviously works for because 85 percent of the people don't make it to collections. Now, there are two sets of laws that prevent any of these 14 or 15 percent from going to the level of a lawsuit. As I said, 1%, 1% of the population makes it to the point of a lawsuit, not 15%, and here's why. Collection agencies don't want to sue people. Well, we can all imagine why. Think about it. They don't want to pay an attorney to file a lawsuit. Right up front, they have $166 court filing fee, a $100 service fee. They have to pay that out of pocket. Whether they can find the person, a lot of times they can't even find them to serve those complaints. They've just thrown away their $200. Then they have to pay the attorneys on top of that whatever is incurred. Currently, the system set up under the modified American rule that, hey, if a collector has to send somebody to, to court, they go in, they have to prove their case just like anybody, any other case. These individuals have due process. They have an, an opportunity to come in and show that they don't owe the money. If they don't owe the money, get, well, guess what? They get their attorney's fees paid. They win. If they do owe the money, the court awards the attorney's fees and court costs. So it's 1% of these people, not 15%, that can incur costs. Uh, back to the reason why. There are two particular laws. One is the Fair Debt, Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. That law specifically says that no collection agency, no matter what the industry is, can add any fees, costs, interest to a debt. So collection agencies can't just add attorney's fees. They can't add. Now, there's an exception on interest. If there's a contract, we in the state of Idaho allow that, pursuant to another code section. But a lot of collection agencies, and including the one that this was designed to silence or shut down, they don't collect any interest unless these go legal because they want the people to pay. They want to take their third. The doctors mostly say, don't worry about enforcing our, our interest. But the FDCPA, if there's not a contract for interest, limits not only interest, it limits attorney's fees, costs. They can't add any fees to these. So these 15 percent of the population do not and cannot, under the FDCPA, incur any costs above the actual cost of the debt. The other law that does this is the Idaho Collection Agency Act, which we amended just the other day, so most of you are familiar with it. It has a statement that says virtually the same exact thing. Collection agencies cannot add court costs, fees, attorney's fees, interest, um, and, and again, there's a reason for that. So doctors want to get paid. So the point being, these 15 percent are not getting anything above the actual debt. The only way you ever have to pay anything more is if you then filter through to become one of that 1% of the population that actually ends up in court. At that point, the, the doctor, the collection agency is paying, like we mentioned, the 200 up front to get through the courthouse doors, get the person served. Also, the, the, the notion that these people do not know there are medical bills out there, I can get some things, I can see it s s ways that something could slip through, but other than that, it's, it's pretty much laughable. Um, like I said, doctors send these bills out. You know if you went to the provider to be expecting a bill. They're sending multiple bills. I've never in my 10 years of doing this ever seen a, a doctor that didn't at least send out three notices, at least three before. We don't even recommend they send the accounts to collections until after 180 days already. And again, the reason is they don't want to. They want to maximize their opportunity to collect it. And so it's not good that they sit on these for years. Some do, some choose to. So a lot of providers already don't send it over for one, two, three years. Um, statute limitations is usually four or five years, depending on the contract. A lot of doctors, because they don't want to sue people, will wait that long. Those others send out their notices, then they send it to the collection agency. 
Um, the collection agency, they don't get paid unless they collect this money. So they do as much research. I mean, they've got full-time staff devoted to finding out where people move to, where they live now, getting current addresses. Some of the individuals will get uh, the case that, that facilitated this whole law being necessary. The person got 27 notices sent to them from the collection agency, let alone the, the doctor's note. So these people are getting notice. If there's a bad address, they request mail return and they'll update the address. So it's very, that's why it's only less than 1% because these people have multiple opportunities, multiple procedures for notice. Um, after that, it's turned over to the, uh, the attorneys if they didn't respond. The, it should also be noted that the federal fair debt collection practices require some of these letters and they require certain things to be in there. Guess what? If you look at the FDCPA, it requires most of what's in the doctor's notice. So not only are the doctors already sending these, the collection agencies are sending another one with the name, the name of the provider, the address of the provider, the dates of service. They're sending that required by federal law. So it's already happening. Um, so on to the cost of this and, and why this becomes more costly for people and, and, and this is going to increase health care costs statewide, every single one of us in this room, plus the people this is intended to help. That 1%, this bill is going to increase medical health care costs on every single person in this room and I can guarantee it and here's why. Currently, doctors are able to send these bills out for collections after sufficient time to let the bill sit there, give people as many opportunities as they can to pay so the doctor doesn't have to take a haircut. Once that doesn't happen, it goes to collections. Um, like I said, the current system, the, the, the loser in a lawsuit would pay the court costs and the attorney's fees. I'm going to sidetrack real quick because I think it's also important to note that these attorney's fees in the state of Idaho, while you're bored here for the next little while, go ahead and look up Idaho Rule of Civil Procedure 54, a particular note is 54E. What that says is... <clears throat> that currently in Idaho, you cannot get attorney's fees greater than the principal amount. I think it's principal and interest, actually. So we hear these stories of a $200 bill with $6,000 attorney's fees. Not true, not possible. Go look at Idaho Rule of Civil Procedure 54. There's always two sides to the story, and you've only been told one side of this story. It's already in law that the, print, that the attorney's fees cannot be more than that principal. So if you have a $200 medical bill and somehow you're not one of the 99% that manages to avoid a lawsuit, and you're in that 1%, you can only get $200 attorney's fees on that bill. You can't get 6,000. It's in rule. More, more half truths that we're told. Now what can happen is if a person doesn't pay that bill, once the court determines a judgment, just like any other judgment, there's no special rule that once you have a judgment for this or that, we treat you any differently. It's kind of called equal protection. But what then happens is a person can file a garnishment. The sheriff's going to charge his fees of $50, $60 to go serve that garnishment. <clears throat> if it's successful, case is over. That $200 is paid through a garnishment. Um, people quit their jobs just so they can't be garnished. People avoid garnishments. Um, there's another provision in there that if gives somebody a right to contest the, the, the garnishment, even after it's in judgment, they can file on every garnishment we're required in law by, in Idaho to send to that judgment debtor a list of exemptions that they could possibly claim. They can file an exemption and say, one I don't have, guess what? If you make less than about $1,000, you can't be garnished in the state of Idaho. We, we have most of the people in this state that make less than that are on Medicaid or Medicaid expansion now, or they will be. So this is not protecting that bottom tier of society that doesn't have money to pay medical bills. This, what, what I typically see, the 1%, now there are exceptions to this, people have attempted to avoid to get there to be sued. Now, occasionally it happens that there are horrible circumstances in life. We all know that, but these are not, like I said, the, the lower, lower tier, the Lower income brackets of society are already covered by public assistance. Most of the counties have county assistance. Um, <clears throat> so they, they get to collections, they're capped at those attorney's fees. Garnishments go out, you got 50 here, 50 there for sheriff's fees. These are not, attorneys can't add fees. Um, the judgment has that amount. So I've seen people get three or four garnishments. Um, now there's post judgment interest that can add to it. That's currently set by us, 12%, another solution. Maybe 
Washington State did this in, in probably the most restricted policy in the country until ours passes, Washington did this, and what they did, they limited the interest rate on medical debt. That's a law that's been tested time and time again with courts of changing interest rates for various things. That's something we could have done that I think the Supreme Court will likely take into consideration when this law is challenged, should it pass. Was this the most restrictive rate? There were ways to do it. The notices, sending out notices. Why, why is there a timeline on any of this? In that committee, they heard testimony from billers and doctors that said there could potentially be cases where a person can't get, for whatever reasons, there's insurance negotiation or they can't find r correct information, that it could take them longer than 45, 60 days. They're not going to send it to collections if they haven't been able to do these things. Like I said, first of all, they're waiting that long anyway. But, but why the dates? Why, why the restrictive timelines? Now, later on in this law, there's a perception that said, hey, if any of these dates are missed, you can go ahead and do it, but you can't take extraordinary collection efforts. So you, you basically lose your property right if you don't comply strictly with these deadlines. You also lose your right to the courts. The Idaho Constitution, I think this is really important, Art, Article 1, Section 7, talks to a right to trial by jury. <clears throat> I was told specifically part of the intent of this bill was to prevent, to encourage people to go to small claims. Guess what? You don't get a jury in small claims. Guess what? You don't have a right to counsel in small claims. In fact, you're specifically prohibited from appearing in small claims with an attorney. <clears throat> I happen to be on, listed as a manager on a company I've never gotten a dollar for for doing any work. I've never received a paycheck from any collection agency except for my work as an attorney. I'm listed as a manager so that when they're sued and brought into small claims, they don't have to send a full-time employee over there to, expect, to explain everything. I go do that, then they have to pay me because they don't get their fees there. This law, part of the intent was to force medical providers, health care providers to go to small claims. Talk about an infringement of the right to trial by jury. Talk about infringement of the, the right to assistance of counsel. Fundamental constitutional protections that our founding fathers put in for a reason. Is this the least restrictive way to take care of if there is actually a, a legitimate state interest in this? I don't think so. I, in fact, I can name 20 that are a lot less restrictive that would still protect a doctor and every right that he has, including these rights to jury trial and assistance of counsel. Um, other constitutional rights, in fact, the attorney fee cap, if I had my choice, I don't care if this affects me. I don't care if I have to go find a new line of work. That's fine. I told, I told the individuals bringing this bill right from the beginning, if I can find a way to keep people out of medical pr collections, to help doctors get paid and put myself out of job, I'm more than happy to do that. Let's get together. Let's do it, work for a solution. It was never done. Until this bill was drafted, <clears throat> IHA, IMA, they say, oh, they're neutral on these. Let me tell you how they got to neutral. Many of you already know that. This bill was drafted. It came out and it shocked the conscience of so many people, health care providers all around the state. IMI, IHA opposed it. So they sit down in negotiations. Anyone ever try to negotiate with a gun to your head? I wouldn't recommend it. And that's basically what, what happened to the IMA and the IHA. They, they said, look, we don't like this law, but it's going to go through. And we have, to, we have to negotiate to make it better to get to neutral. That's how those negotiations went. So they became neutral because they changed dates. They changed timelines. But fundamentally, the, the committee members know from the emails they received, from the testimony at that hearing, my, my, my note was there were there was a, uh, several people that showed up to attend that were all flown over in a private plane. To my count, I believe that was just about all that testified in favor. On the other side, you had doctors, health care providers, medical billers, many people opposing it. The, the emails that the committee received, you all got a folder of... I don't know, 200 form letters that were created calling on attorneys unethical, blah, 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 a lot of nice things, um, all generated from a marketing campaign that was going on for a year that's had countless numbers of dollars um, jumped into this fund. Um, on the other side, you had emails that were generated by professionals that this would affect all across the, the state. Back to the issue of why the attorney's fees or the, the health care costs in the state are going to go up if we pass this law. We've already went through the scenario why doctors don't want to send it to collection and now how, if they happen to end up in collections, they can recover their court costs and their attorney's fees because the system that this state has set up and everything is that 
if it looks legitimate that a person was sued, that to enforce a property right, the winner can have his attorney's fees and court costs reimbursed. These are not big attorney's fees on small bills. Um, so what's now going to happen under this current system should we pass this law? I'll still be in business. Maybe if I choose to do it, I might not. This hasn't been a, a lot of fun. And it's not a sympathetic industry, and I get that. But here's what's going to happen. Doctors now, take for example, I have one client that probably sends, you know, there, there's several doctors. I think there's about 10 in this group, and they probably send $1.5 million to collections every year. Um, right now, we're able to return. You, the other thing on the uh, part of this is that 1%, it's about 50% of these that are never recovered anyway either because the people are, don't make enough money or they move jobs or they're self-employed, there's no ways to garnish. So a lot of these fees that are allegedly awarded are never recovered anyway. But currently, because a doctor can recover those, it makes some sense. So this, this particular group I'm referencing now, say they send 1.5 million over for collection, and just assume I'm able to collect 100% of it, which it doesn't, they're, they're losing a third of that. So they're still recovering, you know, what is that, 100000 per doctor um, it, through collections, which is, which is a pretty significant um, return. Um, these doctors have, obviously, student debts. They have malpractice insurance that, frankly, can cost that, all because of regulations we've put on. So now they're faced with a choice. We can send them to a collection agency, but we can't take, you know, well, that's considered extraordinary collection under this. Um, which is another side point of all the terms that we're creating to muddy up the statutes in this, this state. I mean, there's a list of definitions that go on, including extraordinary collection activities. Never heard of that term before now. I, I understand somebody said they found it in another state's code, but it, it doesn't fit in nicely with everything we already have in code. But, so we've got this term, extraordinary collections. So just assume now a doctor complies with all these things, because they normally would, and goes to collections. <clears throat> they can still do that, but they now can't, they send it to, so it's in collections and, and they're able to collect whatever percentage they normally could collect without filing a lawsuit, which is 99% of everybody. Uh, so they narrow that down and a doctor, uh, a doctor still has a percentage, say 100,000, couple hundred thousand that they can't collect. They can either write that off and raise everybody's health care to offset the, the loss they took that year or they can still file a lawsuit. I know a lot of these doctors don't want to sue, but they'll do it on principle if they think somebody's avoiding them. 99% of the cases I deal with on the legal end are that 1%, and usually it's because somebody's trying to avoid it. Like I said, there are people out there that can't, and they get forced into this. So then a doctor's got to make a choice. Is he going to turn it over to the attorneys and risk the fees and costs that are part of this bill, or is he just going to raise his rates to offset what he can't collect? We all know how that works. There's, there's no secret there. All of us would do the same thing. We feel we're entitled. Or the other thing, the reason collection industry will be okay if, they, if this passes is they're going to then tell the medical providers, you know what, because we can't get the cost reimbursed from the person that's refusing to pay or not paying, you're going to have to pay these court costs and attorney's fees. And that's probably going to be done by telling the doctors or the health care providers, I can do that for one-third of whatever we collect. So now you're going to have to give one-third to the collection agency and one-third to the attorneys to offset this. Who's going to pay that? We are. Every citizen in the state of Idaho is going to pay that increased health care costs. It's just, it, it's a basic principle of economics. That's how it works. That's how it's going to work. So this is a costly set of regulations to every single one of us. Um, I. In the uh, statement of purpose, this talks about free market solutions. Um, I'm not even going to get into that because we can all see this is not a free market solution now. The argument has been made that, well, healthcare industry isn't really a free market right now. I'd, I'd agree with that, and I think that's a problem. I think that's why we all pay so much for healthcare. If we could go backwards and start peeling off regulations, we could probably help people in this state by giving them affordable health care, reducing the cost to doctors. Like I said, already 7% just to, to bill, but not by adding another layer of regulations. You can see fundamentally how this is going to add more regulation. Um, on to the attorney's fee cap provision, the $350 and the $750. <clears throat> the $350 is extremely problematic. 
And let me tell you why. This is the, the sole provision that's trying to force these to small claim and that's trying to, de to depri deprive the medical industry of its right to counsel and the right to jury trials. The way that happens, I've already said, to get into the courthouse doors. We've decided, the judicial branch, that there's got to be a fee to help pay the court costs. The Supreme Court has set those fees, currently $166. It jumped up, it used to be about $90, and it jumped up to that to pay for the Odyssey system that we implemented a few years ago. So it's now $166 to file a court case. So right up front, you have those court costs. Next, you have the service fee, which we've also said, by law, is recoverable. We, we want people to get their costs back if they have to file a lawsuit. And if they win, currently, we've decided that if a party loses, the losing party pays the court costs. Well, I think that makes sense because it, it encourages people to avoid going to court if they think they're not going to win because they can't get their court fees recorded, reimbursed. So right now, you've got the $166 fee, the service fee of about $100. So you're 266 right there. <clears throat> Currently, the way the attorney's fee provision has been written by the Supreme Court in Rule 54 is you get your costs plus attorney's fees. So if I sue on a $200 bill, you get $200 attorney's fees or less. If a judge, the judge can't go above that, but a judge can always cut that amount. There are a whole list of factors in 54 that says what a judge must consider when they're doing rules or, or awards of attorney's fees. So take 350 and subtract 270. There's your $80. So you got to go find an attorney. Uh, I would say in a minimum in a lawsuit, you have, well, by the time you review the documents, get it said, maybe, maybe an hour, but then you have a default. You've got to apply. So after you file a complaint, you serve the person, which, by the way, is a very important point that I think I've neglected to say. You don't get garnished, and that's the first notice you ever heard of a medical bill. If somebody tells you that, it's not true. Go look at our, our rules of civil procedure in the state of Idaho. Mo I, I've never seen a debt collector that does uh, publication notices. Um, I, in my 15 years of doing it, I've, I've never done it by publication because one, it's, it's costly and it makes no sense because you're publishing it. So every single person under Idaho law right now has to be physically handed a copy of the complaint and summons. Now, it can be an adult over 18 in their house, so there's, you know, if they have an adult kid who's slacking and puts it on the TV, there's, there's a slight possibility, but it's pretty rare because most of the time you're handed the complaint and summons. You have personal notice of the lawsuit against you. So, this, so there's just another opportunity to show that these people have notice of these bills before they get garnished. Um, back to, so the garnishment. I lost track of where I was. I got off, off point there. I apologize. So, right through the courthouse door, you've got those fees. We say $80 to find it, to find an attorney. Um, and the, the intent of that was, we're going to force people to small claims. Well, just, just assume that a doctor decides, you know what, I don't want to take my two-thirds or whatever, I, I want to sue in small claims. Um, so they've got to hire office staff. Now, a new position created in doctor's offices to go file lawsuits in small claims courts or the collection agency has to do that, and so maybe their 33% becomes 35%. I, I don't know. Different providers are going to choose different ways of doing it. But it's just a, another, you can't force people to small claims. Plus, like I said, the right to jury trial, all those special rights that people should be afforded under the constitutions are taken away because we're trying to force them to do one thing. You're not like anyone else in the state. You're not like the credit card companies or the, these other industries. You have to do it this way because, well, you don't know, the state's got some important legitimate interest in protecting this 1% of the people. So it's really problematic because in other states, too recently in the last few years, have decided this exact issue. The state of Florida and the state of Utah. In the last two years, there's been Supreme Court cases in both states. And ours will be the same if we pass this, I'm just telling you right now. What they did is and the legislative branch said, hey, in workman's comp cases, these attorney's fees are, are out of control. So what we're going to do is we're going to cap them and we're going to say, hey, we're not sure what it should be. Um, lay, set an attorney's fee cap on these types of awards. So, so they did. Um, in both cases, in Florida and Utah, what they found is the result is the, the fees were capped. Maybe it was $2,000 and it seemed like, hey, that's great. $2,000 for a case, you can do that. But if all of a sudden you're into a case and it's so contested that you have 
hundreds of hours in it, all of a sudden you're losing it. The Florida cases, some of them they looked at, the attorney's fee was $1.53 per hour by the time the attorneys had done the work to, to finish those cases. And you just, so what they said in both cases, it was you're depriving us of the representation of counsel because we cannot find counsel that's willing to do it for this amount, which is going to be the case here. Um, and so in both Supreme Courts, I should mention to preface this, in, I, in the Idaho State Constitution, we have two provisions talking about the judicial department and what we delegate to them and what we keep for ourselves in the separation of powers doctrine. Um, Article 5 is the judicial department. Section 2 says the judicial power of the state shall be vested in a court for trial of impeachment in the Supreme Court. So the powers of the judicial are vested in the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has the sole rulemaking theory, the, <laughs> authority, I'm losing my words now, has the, so the Supreme Court has a sole rulemaking authority. We don't make rules for the court. That's a separation of, of powers issue. Now, there's some things we can do, some things we can't. But one of them in particular we can't because we delegate that authority to the judicial branch is make those court rules. Uh, article, article, two, or article 5, Section 13 of the Idaho State Constitution talks about the power of the legislature respecting the courts. The legislature shall have no power to deprive the judicial department of any power or jurisdiction which rightly, rightly pertains to it as a court, coordinate department of the government. We all know that. We know the separation of powers. We can't make laws that's in their purview. So those, those are important factors because the Utah Consti Constitution that the courts decided on in that Supreme Court case relied on Utah constitutional provisions that were virtually identical to ours when it comes to the separation of the powers in the judicial branch. And I'm not going to read a lot, but I would ask unanimous consent just to read one paragraph from the, United, the Utah Supreme Court case, case decision. Without objection? Gentlemen, may read the paragraph. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> What it says, conclusion in this Utah Supreme Court case, it says, our state constitution explicitly grants the Supreme Court the exclusive authority to govern the practice of law. The regulation of attorney's fees undoubtedly falls within the practice of law. Although we have power to delegate this authority to the bar and maintain supervisory oversight, we cannot delegate the power to govern the practice of the law to the legislature. This would violate the separation of powers clause because the ability to delegate the authority to another branch of our state government is not expressly directed directed or permitted in the text of the Utah Constitution. I'd invite you to look at the Utah Constitution when it comes to the judicial branch and compare it to ours. You'll find that they're about the same. Florida's was the same case. And both Supreme Courts said you cannot, the, the legislative branch cannot cap the attorney's fees. Now we can set parameters as to when attorney's fees should be awarded. We've done that in uh, Idaho Code 12, 120s is a five, well, I think there's 18 or 19 provisions saying when you can get attorney's fees and, and when you can't. But what they can't do is put a hard cap like that. It's been tried recently in other states, and every time the Supreme Court has said, legislative branch, you don't have the authority to do that. That's a, that's a judicial branch theory, and I would anticipate it'll be the same. Bottom line on all of this is there are so many things we could do to help people in these scenarios without so much regulation, violating every notion of equal protection, every notion of small and limited government. There are things that we could do if we told the parties, go back, work with everybody involved from the beginning. Don't come with a set of, of a statute and say, yeah, this is going to pass because we've got so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so already in support, and so you better negotiate with this, and we'll change a date for you or change a date. If we all got together, the industries, the last time we wrote the Collection Practices Act, I was on, it was long before I was here, and we met almost monthly in the basement of the Supreme Court. And we had representatives from large employers, representatives from small employers, um, collection attorneys, uh, health care providers, um, the banking association was there, legal aid was there. And we worked on something for a year and a half until we had all agreement. And, and legal aid, I think, was, a, was an important component of that because all of us in there were trying to help people get paid while keeping the costs and the fees down for everybody. That was the goal. None of us want huge costs or fees on people in society that are maybe least prepared to pay that. But that should be the goal of any legislation we do here, is how do we draft legislation that is so 
not so restrictive and it's going to jack up the cost of health care for everybody, how do we come to a solution? We all share the same goal of reducing health care costs, uh, of making it affordable to everybody, increasing access to health care. This only makes it worse. It makes it harder for everybody. So I already know the outcome of this vote. I'd like to think I'm wrong. I'd like to think that this speech influenced any, anybody in here, but unfortunately, I don't think that's the case. But I would still tell you, look deep within yourselves, look at what you know. Is this really going to make health care access more affordable for anybody? Is it going to raise the cost for everybody? Is there a way we can do this? And I, I, I'm not just saying this to try and kill Bill. I truly believe there are things that we can do. Uh, you know, the first couple of pages about sending notices and stuff, I think for the most part, doctors are already doing that. Like I said, you take dates out there, you put these lists out there. Doctors would come to the table and, and say, here's what we think we can do. And these are the experts in our, our industry, these medical bill, bill, uh, coders and billers, some of which you heard from in committee. These people would have the answers of how to make sure it's completely transparent. We could come up with laws to fix that. As far as, as, far as court costs, interests, stuff like that, I have a lot of answers for that too. I think there's other people that would be willing to sit down and find solutions that would accomplish everything and more that this bill does without increasing costs on every single Idahoan, without increasing regulation. And um, I think that's pretty, it, it can be seen on the face of the bill. So appreciate everyone hearing me out. Um, I would encourage everyone to vote against this costly piece of legislation. Thank you.